If you enjoy watching Common Ground online, please consider making a tax-deductible contribution at lptv.org. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Hi, I'm Rachel Johnson, and thanks for joining us on Common Ground. This week, Levi Brown and Shirley Nordrum instruct young people from Bina and surrounding communities in archery and other traditional Native American skills. Farron Blakely, a Native artist from the White Earth Reservation, tells us how art elevated him from gangs in Minneapolis to a loving father. Then we'll suit up for the Minnesota Finlandia Cross Country Ski Marathon in Bemidji. We'll show you what makes this race one of the most prestigious and challenging events in the world. I'm Shirley Nordrum and we're here at the Bina Community Center at the 4th Annual Winter Archery Day Camp. This is an event that we plan every year for the youth over their winter break and we offer a number of activities. The primary activity that's the biggest draw is archery. Archery is huge on the reservation. Myself, my nephew Andreas, my sister Sharon, and work with youth coordinators and we um, offer archery nearly every weekend out of the year. We do this event to help the youth connect with their culture. Maybe they don't have an opportunity or they haven't had these things shared with them before. So the primary thing is hunting and gathering, being able to provide for yourself, being self-sufficient, and being able to eat good food. But there's a lot of other things that go along with that too. Um, in past years we've had drum making. Utilizing all the parts of the deer, not only the meat for the food, but you can use skins to make clothing or to make drum. And we made drum to help youth learn how to sing and you know, make hand drums. They might do that at a powwow, they might do that at a ceremony. But all these things are very important. Um, how are the youth supposed to know how to carry on and teach their youth if we don't offer opportunities to share and come together and keep our culture alive and, and vital. If we teach our young people why their natural resources are important to them, at a young age they're more likely to succeed in the sense that they won't have to ask anybody how to do things. So when somebody comes up to them and says, hey, let's go set a rabbit snare, hey, let's go ricing, Let's go hunting. They won't feel so shy to, and they won't say, no, I don't want to go because I don't know how. And the whole point of this is to show them, give them a little bit of insight. So when somebody comes up to them and does say, let's go do something, they, they feel comfortable and say, I've done that before, I can do this. And it, in the, at the end of the day, it's in, our, it's in our identity, it's in who we are, it's in our culture. And so our whole goal with something like this is to bring it all full circle, show that there's a recreational aspect and there's also the cultural aspect, and there's also the a community aspect, people being together. Today the youth are making bracelets. My sister is helping them braid these bracelets as a craft activity. We've already had a talk about hunting and gathering rights that was given by Levi Brown. Levi is also taking youth outside and showing them how to track a deer, if they were to shoot a deer, things that they would look for to help them find and locate that deer. Later on in the day, we're going to be having a session on Ojibwe language as part of the revitalization. We'll also be having some stargazing later on tonight and talking about Ojibwe astronomy and how we saw the stars. We have our own traditions and stories that go with those stars, and we're going to be sharing a few of those stories later tonight. My, my favorite thing to teach you know, some of the kids and, and to watch them experience things is, is to show them how an animal re relates to you know, their environment and how to show them that there's more than just inside their house or the school or the school bus or their day-to-day -day activity, that there's a big world outside of what they live in. 
and that I try to teach them that even myself with a college degree and other things, I only know this much about the world. And there's so much to know. And, and to get them that, to see that they only know a little bit, it opens their mind and they'll become a better human being. And that's really important for, I think, young people to understand. My favorite part is archery. I just see the youth gaining so many skills from that um, self-confidence and, and um, being able to to see themselves improve over time as they shoot, you know, arrow after arrow, they start, you can see them thinking about precision and accuracy and, and competing with themselves inside, becoming a stronger person inside by focusing and thinking about being aware of what they're doing. Not only is it a, is it an activity for youth, but we're trying to, so, you know, bring social change. Show our youth that people care about them and that you know they are important they're you know treasure so the first year we started out we had like 15 youth you had grew to 20 to 40 and i think there's over 80 youth here today i think there's a need for that and we hope to keep offering different types not just over winter break but different culture camps different learning opportunities bringing community together and sharing we have parents here with their youth we have youth coordinators here, we have Boys and Girls Club, and that's what community is all about. If we're strong as a community, vital as a community, we're just better because of that. So that's my dream, is the people sharing, coming together, eating food, teaching, learning, and just coming together as community. I would actually like to see some of the youth come back and um, become volunteers here. I'd like to see them take archery seriously, maybe competition, or at least teach their kids to do different things. Basically, I would like to see it continue on. I'd like to see more and more young kids get involved. And the kids here hope they share it with their younger brothers and sisters. I really do. I am Farron Blakely. I'm enrolled in the White Earth Tribe in Minnesota. I was raised in Minneapolis for 30 years and then I moved to Fargo, North Dakota. And I'm a self-taught artist, Native American artist. I usually like to use acrylic paint, a lot of glitter because I like to use that for the Native American regalia that I paint. The whole reason why I love to paint is just because of the beauty of our culture. My paintings show the beauty of our people, basically. And it doesn't matter if it's Anishinaabe or Dakota or whatever, it's all beauty to me. I like to do a lot of donating and giving, especially to our veterans. I love to donate my art to the veterans. It's my way of giving back to them, thanking them. And that's really helped me be accepted by um, all my Native people. Not just Native either, but other cultures. Here's some examples of my artwork. I was blessed to be invited to what was called the first annual Winnie Fest in Bina, Minnesota. A lot of people know my art over that way. My mother's from Leech Lake, so they gave me a call and brought me there. It was an honor to be able to paint the kids' faces, show my artwork over in that area of Minnesota. Um, it was a real honor and opportunity to be able to go over there and uh, express myself. I grew up in Minneapolis for 30, 30 years in the inner city. And you know, um, along, along with that, with my surroundings was gangs. So in order for me to feel like I was fit in, I had to like join a gang, you know? So I was in a gang for 15 years. And you know, all those years, I, I never really knew who I was. Art helped me get away from the surroundings of the inner city. At 19, I drowned in the Mississippi River and lost my left leg. And, I died and everything, and for some reason I'm, I'm, I'm still here, you know. And now I know that reason is that I'm married now, I have five children, and my artwork is my way of giving back to my people, you know. And my oldest brother, he would have been 44, he drowned when he was seven. So when I was drowning and dying and, you know, choking on that water, I didn't feel nothing because I seen my brother. So I can tell you firsthand that drowning is painless. And I think that happens for anybody that has a near-death experience, no matter if you're burning, car accident, something happens and you, it takes you away from 
the pain of whatever is going on. So that taught me a lot about, you know, just respecting life and my elders, you know. Now that I got a chance to be the man I'm supposed to be, I use my art to what I want in the future, what I've dreamt about, you know, being the man I'm supposed to be, I dream about long ago of our people, you know. And, and just my surroundings, you know, I mean, but I, I try to do positive things, you know, with Native American art, you know. Uh, a friend of mine came to me one time and said, how come none of your Native people in your paintings are smiling? And I, I told them, well, my paintings go all the way through from the beginning to where when we started being hurt as a people and disrespected, we had nothing to smile about, you know. Our smiles come through our beauty of our culture, our dancing, our drumming, our singing, just who we are as people and when we live a native life, you know. So, I mean, that's the meaning behind my art, you know, and uh, I want to say that it, it's really tough, not only as an artist, but as a Native American artist, to get the, maybe the exposure, maybe the respect. I just want to be able to, you know, show the world uh, what I can do. And, and, and that's coming, it's working for me, you know. Right now I'm a father and I'm raising my five children and I just want the world to be able to see my work, you know what I mean? And feel my heart and where I'm coming from, from, you know, because I'm just a man. I'm married now, I have five children, and I want them to be proud of who I am before I leave this earth. And my art will be here long after I'm gone, you know. So, you know, I want them to say they're proud of Farron Blakely instead of saying, oh no, here comes Farron Blakely, you know what I mean? And my mother told me to uh, do something with my art, so she's my best friend, you know, my mother. The, the pieces I have now, it just shows the beauty of our culture, you know. There's no other explanation about it, you know, with the colors. I always try to put something in there that's with our land or with our brothers and sisters that have wings, that swim in the water, you know, on four legs. It just comes from my heart, you know. And anybody that sees Native American powwows, which is really called celebrations, they see that beauty, they can feel it, you know what I mean? And when they see my art, they get that same feeling from it. I believe that um, the Winnie Fest and other, other gathering, Native American gatherings, for one thing, needs to, be, it needs to happen more often because it brings us together. It brings us together in a good way um, with all the negativity that's out there with our people on the reservations. It, it, it helps our youth especially connect with the elders other parents, you know, in a, in a positive environment so that they can um, feel good about themselves, you know, s see the talents that our people can do and hopefully inspire them with uh, the talent they probably know they don't even have yet, you know. My art, I would say, is helping me become a better father as far as learning my culture behind it. Not afraid to ask questions to my elders about my culture. Uh, then I can put that into my artwork, so I make sure that I'm not doing something wrong, you know what I mean, stepping on any toes. I want the, the only thing I like to do is express what I've, I've learned with my art and my culture. You know, I'm not going to do anything that um, I don't know what I'm talking about and expressing it through my canvas. So. To see my work, to purchase any of my work, I do more than just paintings. I have other uh, Native American regalias that I do. You can find that on the internet, on Facebook, under my name, Farron Blakely. This is the premier event in the Greater Bemidji area, the Minnesota Finlandia Ski Marathon. We have a variety of events people can do. We've got a 50K skating race, we've got a 25K skating race, a 25K classical race, and a really unique race called the Pursuit, where they ski half of the race on their classical skis and the other half on their skate skis. My name is Mark Walters. I'm the Nordic ski coach at the Bemidji High School and I've been doing this for about 10 years, and I'm also the trail administrator for all of what you see out here. We are here for our biggest race of the season locally, which is the Minnesota Finlandia Ski Marathon. 
I have lots of high school skiers here, past high school skiers. We have a variety of events to choose from. You can do the 25K Classic. You can do a 25 kilometer freestyle skating style event. We have a combination event called the Pursuit where we're going to classic the east half of Buena Vista and then skate the west half. And then there's the main event, which is the 50K freestyle marathon. Right now we're at Buena Vista Ski Area. We're standing on the cross country trails at Buena Vista Ski Area that uh, the Minnesota Finlandia is, is held at every February uh, around President's Day. The Minnesota Finlandia is the second oldest ski race in Minnesota and it was one of the first, what's now the American Ski Marathon Series, which is a series of races throughout the country in Alaska, Colorado, um, Wisconsin, uh, which is the Berkebeiner, and uh, others out in the East Coast. We are part of that series, in which there's 12 different events throughout the winter, and we're one of the founding members of that American Ski Marathon Series. My goal today is to do the 25 kilometer classical ski race. And I'm gonna use that as a warm up to an event coming up next weekend, which is a big classical ski race for me. Um, the 25K Classic is um, simply running the entire east side of the Buena Vista trail system back through this transition area, through the tunnel, and then the big hilly west side and back on in. No, I've never skied the Minnesota Finlandia. I have skied the course many a times, but uh, I have just never had the time to do the Finlandia. My name is Mark Morrissey. I'm the chief of course for Finlandia. I do a lot of the trail grooming out here, getting the course ready, and we try to make it a really nice experience for everybody from the racers to the 10K tour for the first time. Uh, I'm going to ski around, try to get with some skiers and kind of get a point of view. Uh, and take some little video of techniques that the skiers use. Kind of show you around the course. Woo! Yeah, Go thanks. Uh, we got a lot more snow than we've had, and so we're having a lot of fun with it this year. We had drifts like we're out in Yellowstone, so we had to work the snow down to get it fast. That's the way the skiers like it. The skiers like to go fast. So it's a joy to work with this organization. We're having a lot of fun. Ski racers. Hey, volunteers, wave to me! Volunteers, wave to me! Wave to me! When you're yeah. the pursuit race, folks going into the transition area, coming and going out with their skate skis on. We have uh, five different events. We have the Minnesota Finlandia 50K Marathon, which was the original race. Um, we have the 25K Classic. We have a 25K Skate or Freestyle and a 25K Pursuit, Continuous Pursuit, which is uh, a leg of Classic and a, and a leg of Skate um, and the Northwoods Tour. The Northwoods Tour is a 10K tour. It doesn't go the full course. It, just gives people an introduction as to what the trails are looking like. They get to participate in the feed stations and uh, go through the finish line. For a lot of people, the beginning of this race can be a little intimidating. If you look in the background, there's the huge climb up Sunnyside, which gets you over the top of the Continental Divide. The east side, though, is, is very rolling and comfortable terrain to ski. Once you go through the tunnel and enter the west, there's some big climbs, some very technical descents, and that is a challenge for a lot of people. For a classical skier like myself, it's a matter of hitting the kick wax correct so that I can stay in the classical track and not slip and slide all around. The course is very challenging. That's one thing that we continually hear from skiers from all over the world, really. It's a challenging course. It's also very beautiful and very scenic. One of the more challenging parts is skiers at one point, right out of the start, have to ski up the downhill area that Buena Vista offers. It's also a downhill area, and skiers within the first K are heading straight up the hill. You know, we're on a very historic piece of ground here owned by the Dickinsons and this whole Buena Vista piece of land. Behind us again is the Continental Divide, which actually has flowage that goes towards the north into the whole Hudson, Winnipegish kind of region and then uh, into the Mississippi watershed. It's huge up there. I mean, that's, it's one of the biggest hills here for downhill skiing yet we have to go up it. Again, it, it's a huge challenge, and for the people that go around this course twice, the thought of going around and hitting that climb again is pretty intimidating. People just have to learn to pace themselves going up it because it, it takes about two, two and a half minutes to get up it. 
The pursuit race is something new within the past six years. We kind of found a little niche or a need for something different and uh, we're one of the only marathon series that has the pursuit. And what it entails is they start with the 25K Classic. They do 14K on their classic skis, then they come in and transition on the fly, and then they go and skate 12K on the other side of the course and then finish in the same fashion. So it's a 25K altogether. The two different styles of skiing that uh, people do at the Finlandia are number one, classic skiing, which is basically the original type of skiing. I believe it's the Norwegians that invented it, but it's basically shushing your feet back and forth in a track that we put in the snow, and they've got what's called a kick zone in the middle of their skis that are able to grip, so you grip and then you glide. The other style is freestyle or skate, in which it's very similar to ice skating, which got, you know, longer skis. It's the faster way to get around the course. So skate, we send out later on. Besides the classic, the classic takes a little bit longer, so they go out earlier. Traditional classical skiing is the foundation of Nordic skiing. It's, it's what most people think about. It's where we have glide wax on the tip and the tail of the ski, and then we're putting a hard wax in the center to give us kick. We need, we need to grab the snow so we can stride forward, okay? Skating came around in the very late 1980s and pretty much dominated Nordic skiing for a good 10 or 15 years. It's just glide wax from tip to tail. It simulates maybe inline skating more than anything else, and there's no kick involved. Okay, it's just pure glide, and it's a very aggressive style of skier. If an athlete is well versed in both, the skating will be about 10% quicker. Skate skiing actually evolved and became a discovery. It, it actually was a little bit of a piece of classical skiing where we started keeping one of our skis in the track and then pushing off with the other classical ski, which we refer to as the marathon skate. And then of course, it just evolved into, well, let's just skate. Okay, and it's really changed a lot in the way we groom, how we maintain our ski trails. You know, we're always manicuring them really flat so we have a nice fast, fast course. What I think makes this race so great is uh, the snow conditions that we have. Every year we're faced with really interesting challenges with the snow, but we always seem to pull together a fantastic course. I've got a great crew that goes out and grooms this stuff up. And the thing I hear the most from anybody coming in from either the cities or Canada is they can't believe what the trails are really like. They, they just don't believe it. And when they get here, they're stuck and they keep coming back every year. Unlike a lot of ski races, because we are a lap course, meaning if you're doing the 50 kilometer event, you go around twice, there's a handful of spots that a spectator can not only just watch the start and the finish, but they get to watch transition zones in the pursuit. The skiers getting out of their classic ski, jumping into their skate ski. We've got a lap lane where the people are coming through that are going around for their second time. So visually and spectator wise, it's very friendly as well. I think one of the more interesting pieces to the Minnesota Finlandia would be the people. The volunteers are so gracious to spend their day out in the cold, either at the feed stations. Uh, we've got a wonderful Hall of Fame feed with tons of food. Um, that's another thing that we hear a lot of uh, people complimenting on is, is all this wonderful homemade free food. Um, and I think the third would be the course. I think the course kind of speaks for itself. It's a challenging course, but it's also a gratifying course. Uh, when you finish, you feel like you've definitely done something. The biggest draw to cross-country skiing is it's a lifestyle, okay? This is a very healthy sport. It's something that as long as you can walk, you can cross-country ski. It's why I enjoy coaching. My philosophy is I'm giving you a sport that beyond high school and beyond college, you can continue to do this. I ski in huge marathons next to gentlemen and ladies that are in their 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, and they're still skiing strong. In Europe, it's not uncommon to have hundreds of people in their 70s in a big marathon. Well, a good way to get started is check into a local ski club if you have one in your community. Sometimes community ed programs have Nordic ski lessons. Just hook up with some folks that have knowledge. Take a few lessons like anything else. Getting on the right start is the way to progress with it. it makes it a lot less frustrating and it gets you outside in the winter. We typically start uh, getting going in about October or November and uh, start getting our flyers out. 
Um, if you're interested in participating, we do have online registration and we mail out registrations in the fall to all past participants and encourage them to invite their friends. And we do a lot of advertising, a lot now with the internet. We've reached a lot more people worldwide. Uh, we do have two Norwegians in here in the race this year that uh, they were pretty excited to come and, and ski the Finlandia. They've heard from it all the way over in, in Norway. For volunteers to get involved, they can email us or contact uh, Buena Vista to get involved. We're always looking for new blood, board members, volunteers. What people should really come to understand about the Minnesota Finlandia ski race is that it is probably one of the most relaxed, friendly ski marathons that you can come to. If you look around, you can park right here at the start. You can ski your race. You can come back, you can get into your nice warm vehicle. We do the awards right on site. We're not shuttling hundreds of thousands of people in buses back and forth. This course can easily handle five or 600 folks in this exact format. And it's a beautiful, beautiful course. And it's, it's a wonderful warm up to like the American Berkebeiner coming up next weekend and things like that, so. Thanks for joining us on Common Ground. We hope you've enjoyed this episode and we'll see you next week. If you have a segment idea for Common Ground pertaining to North Central Minnesota, contact us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3022. If you enjoyed this episode of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.